Um, my name is Liz and I am based in Montreal and where I teach filmmaking, moving images, and also practice multi-platform documentary. And I thought it would be nice if you maybe introduced yourself um, and what your practice of moving images is like and, and where, you're, where I'm reaching you right now. Thank you, Liz. I'm so excited about, uh, about this conversation, especially with this introduction that you uh, acknowledged. And um, so my name is Tania. Uh, I am the daughter of Yolanda, the granddaughter of Concepcion. And I wish I could uh, name all the women who have come before me, but um, because of several migration processes, um, I am now in Mexico City, a land which is uh, very multicultural, but also which has had a lot of erasure in terms of um, belongings. Um, so I name myself as a desindigenous, desindigenizada, no? which, uh, a woman who has um, come through a process where her, her indigenous roots have been um, taken away, no? But um, this is something that, um, um, I don't know, here in Mexico City, we are talking a lot about, and um, I am a filmmaker, and this is also my way of understanding this place where I, I live in. Mm. Oh, thank you so much. I wanted to ask you just a little bit about your motivation in making this film. If you could just tell us a little bit about how it came about. Sure, so um, I studied um, filmmaking and then documentary film. Uh, and uh, in the process of trying to um, understand my own practice, um, I had several longings. Um, and one of the longings was to work with my grandfather. Because um, when I was uh, younger, much younger, uh, one day um, in one of his birthday parties, he um, had some tequilas on and he had, was like in a very um, sensitive mood. And uh, he shared with me that he was, um, he, regret, he regretted that none of his grandchildren um, had inherited the um, wisdom or the desire to work the land. And um, I was like very, very in the beginning of my yearning to, to approach documentary filmmaking. And of course, I was very naive in what doing a film means. So I said to him, uh, Grandpa, but we should make a film about this. We should make a film about your knowledge or, or I don't know, like you could teach us uh, in a film how you do it. And he was very touched by that. But also I remember that this was like, I don't know, like a kind of spark. And I didn't pursue it uh, immediately. I said like, oh, maybe he was just like, you know, like, in a state of uh, grace with the tequilas and the birthday. So I didn't um, set on the next day to do it. So a lot of, a lo long time passed, so several years passed. And um, just when he was about to die, uh, that was like nine or eight years later, um, just when he was about to die, my mother told me that, um, my grandfather, my grandfather used to ask to her like a couple of times um, if I if I would be if I would um, do the recording. He said it like that, the recording. And um, I was very shocked by this because I didn't know that. And uh, of course, I said that I will assume my promise. So my grandfather died, and I came to to the to the land uh, who is, who, which is uh, from my grandmother and my grandfather, but which my grandmother wanted to, to sell because after the, the death of uh, my grandfather, there was none uh, who would um, work on it, who knew how to work on it or who 
would want to work it from the family. And um, so we asked for my grandmother's permission to, to do some um, approach, filmic approach. I don't know uh, how I said it to her, like, just give me some time before you sell it uh, so I can do something and accomplish my promise. And um, of course, the, the little terrain, the land was completely empty and there was nothing to, to, to record, to film. And that's where my mother had a spark. And she, and she said, you know, we should do a last attempt of harvest um, to honor the, the memory of our, of our grandfather. You know? So that's the beginning of the, of the film. Oh my God, that's so interesting that there could be such a symbiotic relationship between this honoring of the land and the family coming together through both a harvest and a film. That's, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's a beautiful film. It's about this, but it's also a beautiful backstory. Um, well, I wonder if you could also give us a little bit of orientation about the title. From what I gather, it, sure. um, it means leftovers, which I know probably has multiple levels of meaning for you. So tell me a bit about that. When did it become the title and what does it mean for you? Hmm, that's a very good question. So Titiche uh, is a world a word in Nahuatl. Um, so the region where, where we, uh, where my mother was born, where my grandparents um, lived, uh, is a region that is both Nahua and Mistec. Um, and um, it's been uh, several generations since um, we lost uh, track of, uh, of our belonging to these cultures, like uh, to these communities, like uh, due to the process of um, Mestizaje, no? which is like the like um, the cultural pro pro project in Mexico to like make uh, everyone belong to the same um, kind of narrative, which is where half Spanish, half indigenous, but not naming for, uh, which indigenous um, cultures, uh, but just a blend, no? And this is like very problematic, but we come from there, and um, so. Um, my grandmother doesn't speak Nahuatl, but her, the way she speaks about the world is uh, flourished with, uh, with these beautiful words in Nahuatl, you know? And um, something we also call me Mexicanismos, which are like words in Spanish that blend, blend blender? Uh, that, that mix um, Nahuatl and uh, Spanish. So one of the words that my mother, my grandmother used uh, is titisha. And titisha is the Nahuatl word for leftovers. For, and this obeys to also like a tradition in the region, and a, a lot of countries have it also, that um, when some landowners come and pick their, um, their crops, Whatever is left, uh, other people can come and pick. No, uh, as you know, as probably a lot of people from the audience know, no, there's like a beautiful film from Agnes Barda uh, that also touches this subject. No, and how how there is like a um, a beauty in in picking. No, in like searching and picking, and and also it's a very a very political stance on, on of not um, not not letting things um, go to trash. No, it's like giving them a second life. So this was a, a very late um, a very late appreciation of what we were doing. To be honest, what we were doing came from intuition and came from emotion and came from like a kind of discovery and search. No. And um, it was on, so much later than we finished the harvest, like two years passed, mm -hmm. and we were in the editing process, um, that I kind of uh, shifted the way uh, the process of the harvest had gone. Because I had 
me and my mother had a bit of a pessimist kind of um, recollection of what had happened because the harvest was, well, the harvest was not um, plentiful as, as we hoped, no? Mm. So we had this idea a bit of uh, like loss and a bit of um, mm, failure. Mm. But two years happened, two years passed in the editing and I reflected that it was not a loss, it was just a beginning. It was mm -hmm. like something we found in this process that could, could allow us to start again. And, and this is like the remnants, the remnants of this, of my grandfather, of course, but also the remnants of, of the way that people before me um, had to work on the land, to respect the land, to have love for the land. So that's what I'm taking and hopefully this is something that the people who watch the film can also take and um, plant again. Mm. Oh, I love hearing that answer and I love what came forward while you were speaking, this idea of it being a second life. Both the sort of appreciation of the land, uh, this revisiting of your father, but also that really complex word of leftovers and the ending for one and the beginning for something else. That's, that's a really beautiful explanation. Thank you. And it makes the title mean so much more to me. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I was just really impressed with was of course the fact that you shot, directed, edited, produced all of this on your own. I know that that is a tremendous accomplishment and I think it's even more significant with you as a woman. I'm really an advocate <laughs> of as many women behind the camera and in front of the camera. Um, so congratulations on a truly stunning film. And building on that though, I wanna ask you the question of sound design and how, because you manage so much of this on your own, how did you then work with a sound designer? If you can tell me a little bit about that and maybe if there's like a moment in the film that stands out for you that you feel like is particularly illuminating of your approach. Mm. Thanks for that question. And um, yes, completely advocate also of more women and more non-binary people in front on or behind camera. Uh, so, so the thing is that probably because I'm a woman, probably because I'm a woman of color, probably because um, I don't come from a rich family. When I was in film school, I had a lot of doubts about my voice and my ability to be a director. Uh, probably also because the hegemonic, hegemonic um, figure of a director is always no, like very sure of himself no uh, and very like forward and I'm not like that I really cannot work like that and I can't I I don't have certainties I have a lot of questions and a lot of doubts and a lot of like emotions and intuitions but I don't I'm not a person of certainties mm. so one of the things that was really challenging for me when I set uh, out to do to shoot the the harvest of the of, well the, the beginning of the process was that I did not want um, to or I did not um, feel that I could explain to a lot of people what I was going to do so I was set on discovering what we were going to do and I felt that if I had a cinematographer there or a sound person there, I would probably have a lot of insecurities. So I decided I have to do it on my own, also to respect the intimacy of, of the morning that was coming from mm -hmm. my mother and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I decided, well, I have to do it. And I also don't have resources, so I have to do it. So uh, this basically, was like um, the spark that, that made me like take the camera and take my Zoom recorder and do like this kind of also production work. Mm -hmm. um, but to be honest, like I had a lot of um, mistakes, no? a lot of technical mistakes, a lot of um, difficulties. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it also was that since I also edited, mm -hmm. I kind of knew like the, 
like where how to fix the mess no like i knew how to like this this shot apparently doesn't work but perhaps only the end because i remember so so that was also like um, one of the advantages and um one of the biggest um failures to to be to say it in a to say it in this way, but it's I mean, in the end, I think it's not a failure. Uh, was that the sound? Is the sound the direct sound was very, very, very um, lacking, very, very incomplete of a lot of the sounds that I wanted to com to convey in the film. So um, what I decided uh, was to invite a sound designer, but much uh, as I had much advanced like the, um, what I wanted to do a sound designer that was also a direct, um, a direct uh, sound recordist. Yeah. And Mariana Rodriguez, who is my super ally in this film, she came to the very last part of the, of the shooting. He came to, she came to the harvest. And I said, Mariana, to be completely honest with you, we need to do a lot of follies here to, today um, of what is lacking. So we did a lot of Fully exercises like very freely and very playfully and it was so nice because Mariana had the chance to go to the land grasp um, like the beauty of the land and then we took it um, to a long process of folly work but uh, Mariana is a very childish well not, not, not childish like she, she has a childish uh, part and playful part in in a very, I don't know, she's also a very mature and very smart woman, but she also can grasp uh, this other part. And I asked her to, at some points, uh, to do like this kind of um, work of song. And um, in, the, in the planting, uh, we, we try to accomplish a song a song of the elements, no? a song of the seeds, a song that included um, the little details and that could convey the awe and the, I don't know, like really the beauty that we could see on, on this process. So, so in the end it was, yeah, like taking the weaknesses and making them, turning it into something like an opportunity, no? Mm. Oh, that's so interesting because it really is a beautiful concept of the sort of song that emerges from the earth and the song that emerges from people who have spent so much time on the land. And it's, it is a very both playful but also soulful approach to the relationship between culture, sound, story, and land and how you just beautifully weave them all together. It's really a... Thank you. I wanted to, uh, the last question I wanted to ask you is really, you know, comes back to the theme of the film itself, which is the theme of grieving, of grieving your grandfather, of grieving the loss, the potential loss of land in this family and what that means. The grieving of a culture, perhaps, that you feel you lost in losing your grandfather. And it seems like a very, very, important theme now as the world is grieving on so many different levels. So I wonder if you could share with us something that you learned along the way of, about grieving in the process of making this film. Wow. So I hope, um, I, I really hope that this can be a lucid explanation because I find it very changing. You know, I, I don't know if, if this happens to you, Liz, but like the relationship you have with your films changes over time. And um, for me, for example, right now that we are in, no, uh, in quarantine, that we are mostly at our homes, I have this like strong, strong, strong longing to, to the place of, um, where we shot Titiche, the place where my grandmother, grandfather uh, raised their family, where they um, placed the roots of my own life, no? Or, or some of the roots of my own life. And 
it's crazy because as time passes, I see that it's more difficult and more difficult for me to come back there. You know, like mm. when I was shooting, it was something that I could make the effort like um, on a monthly or even two or three times a month to go there. Mm. And, mm. and now uh, as I have to pay my rent and I have to like, no, you know, like uh, accomplish all the everyday um, little things that one has to do to survive, mm. I find it more and more difficult to go there. And, and in a way, um, for me, there, there, there is something like very, very special in having those images mm. as a kind of, um, I, I think it's not, a, I don't know, it's a, it's a moment frozen in time, mm. but especially of my mother, my grandmother, and myself being in the same place. Mm -hmm. And this, this is something that no, as time passes, I feel more and more difficult. And, and, yeah. and I think um, okay. in this sense, uh, I don't have like, I didn't have like the privilege to work with my grandfather mm. uh, in the land. I didn't have the privilege to, to shoot um, the film that we had or that I promised to him, but I had the privilege to mourn mm -hmm. in a collective mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. that loss, the loss of my grandfather and those levels that you mentioned, no? The loss of my grandfather, the loss of the land, the loss of um, our relationship to land. But I had the privilege to, to go hand in hand with my mother and with my grandmother, especially with my mother. Yeah. And uh, I think that is also very, very beautiful that it is not, I mean, my mother is a Catholic. Um, she, well, she practices, she's not super um, um, by the book, but she, is, she practices. But her way of mourning was not Catholic at all. Mm. It was completely free, you know, like it was going to the land and establishing a relationship with the presence mm. of, of my grandfather, no? Mm -hmm. Not a ghost, because I don't like to name it a ghost, because I think that particularly um, is from the tradition of, no, like um, Christianity and Catholicism, no? This uh, idea of souls in pain. Mm -hmm. um, no, the, the, the way that we encountered this presence of my grandfather was not through this soul in pain, no? It was like, through the clouds and through the tree and through the um, flowers. And that to me is more reminiscent of a way of looking at life and death um, that is um, originary from, from the um, communities that our families come from and that probably we lost, no? We lost this possibility to name myself indigenous, possibility to name myself Nahuatl, no? But, but this relationship to, to life and death was completely subscribed in this non-Catholic, non non-Occidental um, worldview. So, um, I don't know, I think there's, I, I'm very grateful to be honest to just have this kind of condensed um, images and sounds of that period of time. And um, I'm definitely is like, a, I don't know, like a light in the tunnel, you know, like mm -hmm. as we are here in lockdown and uh, working on projects has been so difficult this year. No, I don't know what has been your experience, but it's been so challenging to work um, this year on, on film and um, just Titisha, the, the their, like the memory of Titisha or shooting Titisha is what keeps me going to, to what, no, knowing that this will end and that we will come again to gather in um, open spaces uh, with cameras and with the people we love and shoot other films. So. So uh, it's a morning, but it's also like a promise to, of joy in the future, hopefully. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much.
That actually makes me want to ask you one last question. You do. <laughs> um, you mentioned that it is so hard filming in this time. And my students are now turning to their family members to become collaborators because they're in bubbles and this is like a safe way of learning how to film. I wonder what it was like working with your family and if you have any advice for future directors of how to best bring family members into a film process in a sensitive, delicate way. I mean, especially, as you said, your mother was grieving, your father, I mean, your, um, your grandmother was grieving. What, what suggestions do you have in how to work with family members? Well, that's a very, very um, challenging question because I, I, I can probably say what we did, but if you had asked me when I was doing it, I could have not named it. Or I could have not like lucidly explained it. No, it was like a very intuitive way of working with my family. We had worked on a very sh a small short film, um, like. Mm, I don't know, probably eight years before shooting Pitiche uh, with my mother. We, we actually had like this little short film that I did in film school uh, where, we, where I wanted her to tell me a bit of um, the, the mourning process that she had passed after the death of um, my baby brother, who was like uh, the... Um, yeah, like the, the following brother than me, and he died like two days after he was born, and that was a kind of taboo topic that we didn't speak, and through the camera we could speak. So one thing I remembered from that experience was that uh, I didn't have the sensibility to accompany my mother after I had done the questions, and I had just kind of like, oh, okay, thanks, mom, and, and I could kind of like continue my day. But I left something open that then after I did the film, I had to take care of. And I did take care of, but that experience helped me to realize that when one works with your own family, like the processes don't begin when you start shooting and when you finish shooting. It's a process that comes like probably from much earlier and that will I mean, documentaries like that, no? We establish relationships and they come like into real life for years. Hopefully, if you have like, I don't know, like the ethics to do it like in a sensitive way. But so, so the thing is, I, I kind of invited my mother to collaborate in a, such a way that she would be like a real, um, not only protagonist, but a real force of the film and um, in the end I think it was a process where when we finished shooting um, she still had a lot of things that she wanted to share about her morning process about ideas uh, that she had had and I was there. I had to be there to listen to this, even if I did not have a camera, even if the film had finished. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I, I, I do that work, no? Like to, to embrace her and to be responsible of what I opened, no? Mm -hmm. So I think that that would be like my only advice, like to know that um, perhaps we cannot sometimes pay for this collaboration in like monetary terms. Um, but we have to pay with care, we have to pay with time, we have to pay with effort and to like also honor the bonds that we have with or without the film, no? Mm. I'm also like very lucky to have a very good relationship to, with my mother. Mm. I don't know if other family, oh, not all families have this, no? Mm. So there are also other kind of tensions. Mm. So I think that would be, that would be like one advice. But in the end, there are, there are no rules, no? There are, I think, just care, take care of, of your family because they, that's also one thing, no? That they tend to care so much about you that they give you all. Mm -hmm. They give you all and 
and film is like um film can be also like a very how do you say double-edged sword no you say like that mm -hmm. yeah you, mm -hmm. you know the film can be also painful film can be also violent so just really take care of of the people and this should be for even if they are not your family of course no but with family in particular they can be like very willing to give mm -hmm. so just make sure to take care of that mm. that is an unbelievably beautiful answer to that question thank you so much and i wanted to say i hope that in the same spirit that you said that any kind of interview or interaction is like opening something i hope that we will have a chance at another time to talk that i can discover more of your work um this early piece that you mentioned i want to see it if we had more time i want to know about your next projects so let's say for now this is a pause but it's an invitation and an opportunity for a future conversation between us. Completely, Liz. And thank you so much. I just want to say, like, your work is unbelievably stunning, and mm -hmm. everybody at the festival is going to be so lucky to have a chance to experience such a, a really intimate and beautifully told story about one of the most important issues of our time, which is knowledge of the land. Totally, and which I know also Turkey has a very strong tradition of uh, no, rural knowledge and that, yeah, like all our countries, we've been like, like victims of a system which has uh, erased that. And um, I'm sure also like uh, there would be like very interesting conversations in like putting Turkey with uh, uh, Mexico to compare it. And of course, I don't know, like also, no, uh, Quebec, Quebec or uh, like, this is something worldwide, like you say. And um, I just want to also thank you, Liz, for your very kind and very generous reading of Titiche. I'm, I'm very um, like uh, inspired by this conversation. So hopefully, like you say, we, we have a, a continuum. That's wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you.